yeah, it was just just this buzz, this you know all this buzz around the school and who was going to get to be the class who was going to be <laughs> in the auditorium. So yeah, so it was just a, a huge buzz, um, and I think the kind of the lead up to it, people forgot the incidents that had actually happened. So we had lots of um, people jumping over the fence and beating all the brown kids, just random people. Yeah. Yeah. So when you guys came, it was actually a good time to have this discussion because we were always, you know, having these kind of tete a tete across oh. the whole kind of the race spectrum. Oh right, yeah, squash tete, uh, yeah, I used to, yeah, no, yeah, Keegan used to come in all the time just to get my feet going. Um, so yeah, if I was like, it was Keegan's so. <laughs> fault. I think there were, uh, yeah, good, good couple of hundred, most, yeah, definitely. Mm. Um, but I think that, as I said, the atmosphere initially when you guys walked in was kind of awe and silence and, oh my God, are the, are the gods really in front of us, you know, it was that <laughs> oh. Um So yeah, so I think initially it was a little bit sort of daunting, I think, for, for a lot of the students in the auditorium, but then I think people warmed up, I think, as, as you were sharing your stories. I think people were warming up to the idea that we could talk about race. Somebody in the audience raised a question around Asians in football, and it's quite interesting that 20 years on we're, we're still yeah. talking about the same issue. Um, so I think there's been lots of progress that's been made across the race agenda across football, but typically across the African Caribbean field. And I think we probably need to do a lot more around kind of the multi-national dimension of football. No, oh, yeah, for sure. I think, um, well, we're, we're pretty active in where we have our, our dome and our um, uh, our academy um, is, is in an Asian populated area and, and now we're, we're getting sort of Asian kids coming in and using the dome. And so, you know, they, we're trying to integrate, we, we're, we set up partnerships with a lot of the local clubs in, in the area. So um, you know, they're now coming in to, um, to use the dome and, and we're hoping to be able to pick from their, their pool of talented players to come in on, on the QPR side of things. So I know they're certainly making improvements from our from our football club's point of view. Um, it's just actually going into the areas and, and, and wanting to go into the areas and fish for those players. So my day job, I, I work in corporate inclusion. So I work in the city and I do this as a, as a living. <laughs> so, but obviously the language is different. So you don't talk about um, racism or sexism per se, but you would talk about racial bias or, or, or gender bias. Mm. So that the language is sort of toned down for whoever the audience is. So I think in terms of the education program around different communities and um, sort of discrimination that certain communities or disadvantage that certain communities feel, I think, needs to evolve with the changing nature of our communities as well, and, and also our, our sort of corporate institutions. Um, so I think that education programme still needs to exist, but I think just in how we communicate it has to evolve to get those people who have the influence on the side, because nobody wants to be labelled potentially racist or sexist or... So, so can I ask a question yeah. in, in, in terms of what you do and, and mm. what we're doing, as you said, the, the language has now changed. Has that language changed to water down what's going on? I suppose it depends what angle you're looking at it from. I think if I put my campaigning hat on, I would say yes, it is watered mm. down. But also if I was to put my corporate hat on, then I would say you have to evolve the language to get people on side. You can't necessarily, well, I, def, I know I can't go in as a brown woman in a very white organisation and start saying that things need to change. Mm. I need to be able to pitch it to them so that they see a benefit to them right. in their day job, but also in terms of their, their bonus at the end of the day or the end of the year. So, so ultimately, I am still a campaigner but I, I know I have to evolve my approach according to who my audience is. And I know when I speak to my colleagues from non-white backgrounds, I'll be very different to the way that I speak with uh, th those senior leaders in the organisation who won't have understood what disadvantage feels like. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so it, it's all a PR game, yeah. essentially. It goes back to what we were talking about downstairs. Unless you had the problem or felt the problem, you might have empathy for it, but you've got no mm. understanding of it. And that's where we are in football. Any industry you go into, whether it's finance or sports yeah. or wherever, I think it's it's the same. You know, it's always going to be pale me on the scale the further you go up the top. Um, but I think, you know, if we're waiting for people like yourself to hit that top spot, then we're going to be waiting a long time. I think. So how do we influence those people who've got the power currently to, to make those changes? Sense knowing that they don't know what disadvantage feels like but how do you sell it to them and at the end of the day it's half half of the time it's about their pocket you know you know how do you how do you tell them you're going to make a little bit more money you know you know where's the value yeah absolutely yeah